welcome to Singular University Summit. Thanks. Um, Great to be here. And congratulations on your, on your new book. Um, um, both of you have been real pioneers in preventative uh, medicine. Dean and I both trained at Mass General Hospital in sort of high-tech medicine, and now you sort of brought it to the most fundamental of low-tech. Uh, maybe how do you describe your journey a little bit and sort of the fundamentals of where this is taking us? Yeah, well, first of all, we appreciate the chance to be here. And um, for the last over 40 years, I've directed research showing that these very simple changes in lifestyle, a high, I, um, plant-based diet that's low in fat and, and sugar, various stress management techniques, including meditation and yoga, moderate exercise and love and support, or to reduce it down to its essence, to eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. The more diseases we study and the more underlying biological mechanisms we look at, the more evidence we have to show how powerful these simple changes are and how quickly people can get better. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove the power of these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions. And so in our, in our new book, uh, Undo It, which uh, will be up there in a moment, um, we were able to present a new unifying theory. I mean, I was trained at Mass General like you and as, as all doctors were, to view all of these chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes and prostate cancer and Alzheimer's disease as being fundamentally different diseases, different diagnoses and different treatments. But what I've come to realize is that in these four decades of research, we use the same lifestyle intervention and it can reverse all of these different conditions that we've looked at. Uh, uh, we, we were able to show for the first time that heart disease could be reversed. Uh, we did the first randomized trial showing that early stage prostate cancer, uh, by extension breast cancer, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, obesity. Uh, we did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn who got the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work with telomeres showing for the first time we could lengthen telomeres, uh, the ends of our chromosomes that regulate aging. And when we published this in The Lancet, the editors called it reversing aging at a cellular level. We did the first study with, uh, published with Craig Venter showing that uh, these same lifestyle changes could change gene expression, turning on genes that are preventive and turning off ones that uh, promote all of these chronic diseases, over 500 genes in just three months. And we're now in the process of doing the first randomized trial to see whether these same lifestyle changes may affect the progression and perhaps even reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease. And so it's really the unifying theory is that it's really the same intervention because it's really the same disease. And uh, the more diseases we study, the more evidence that we have for that. And so while you know, personalization is great in, if you're talking about a, you know, a targeted immunotherapy for pancreatic cancer and melanoma, for the vast majority of chronic diseases, it's really the same lifestyle intervention for each of them. Uh, and it helps explain, for example, why uh, many people have what are called comorbidities. They'll have high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes and be overweight and have heart disease because they're really all manifestations of the same disorder. Or why entire countries like China 50 or 60 years ago had almost none of these chronic diseases and yet when they start to eat like us and live like us, they start to die like us. And they have the same genetic diversity that we do. But even if, for example, you're not very efficient at metabolizing dietary fat or cholesterol or sugar, if you're not eating that much of them, those differences don't really matter so much. And so it, it radically simplifies the intervention and makes it, you know, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. So, and we all know that sometimes we should do these things, but behavior change is often hard. What are some of the lessons that you've brought to this to actually make it actionable? So I think one of the, to set yourself up for success, it's about scheduling it in and making yourself the, the center of your day because you don't have, you only can only give what, you, what you've given to yourself and you can't give any more than that. So to keep it sustainable, if you can especially start your day and end your day with some self-care and connection, those two are very synergistic and actually create more time, more energy, and more meaning, which then therefore gets you into a virtuous cycle and makes it sustainable. Mm -hmm. So the consistency is actually much more important than the duration. So if we can say um, we wake up and we have a, a little bit of a med meditation time, maybe some gentle stretching, to set our intention for the day is very powerful. And then at the end of the day, if we can do the same as sort of like the bookends and also practice gratitude, that again is one of those things that with even just one minute of a gratitude practice, you're creating more sustainability in your life because that's where true uh, abundance is. 
There's always going to be more outside of ourselves that we're grasping at that's never going to be enough. But if we take time to reflect on what we already have inside, it's just that these are very low-tech hacking what we have. It doesn't cost anything. All the side effects are good ones. <laughs> I, I find that very empowering. So, and then to... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, just to protect those times for self-care and connection like you would any of those other appointments. And, you know, Dean will say, you know, he'll really encourage me as my partner in, in our personal life as well as our professional life. He knows that I'm a better person with everything that I do because of doing those practices. So once our partners, professional and personal, see what a more pleasant person we are to be with <laughs> and more productive, then they support it as well. So the best is to get the people around us that inspire us to live longer and better to join us, to join forces. Right, you can't do it as an island. You should be the family and everyone around you. Yes. So Dean, you're trained as a cardiologist and- we're I'm actually trained as an internist. Internist, uh, okay. Yeah. But uh, well, a lot of your work has been around cardiology and heart disease. Yes. And the real power of undoing it and reversing it. Can you maybe summarize some of that work uh, and the power of this for someone with very advanced uh, chronic disease? Yeah, you know, when I started doing this work, it was thought impossible to reverse heart disease. In fact, everything that we've done over four decades, people thought was impossible. And to me, part of the reason I spend so much time doing science is that it, it properly done, it can redefine what's possible and thereby give, you know, millions of people new hope and new choices, which is why I love doing this work. So when I started doing this work back in 1977, when I was a second year medical student, that was thought impossible. In a series of, of randomized trials, we showed for the first time that even severe heart disease can be reversed in most cases by making these changes. And I also thought that the younger patients who had less severe disease would do better, but I was wrong. It turned out that it's not how old or how sick you are. The more you change, the more you improve at any age, which is a very empowering realization. And to give, a, you know, a, to me, one of the ultimate examples of the power of these very simple lifestyle changes. And, you know, the, the biggest misconception people have, one of the biggest about lifestyle changes is that, oh, diet and lifestyle, that's kind of boring. How powerful could that be? Well, pretty damn powerful. I mean, let me just give you an example. We have uh, several patients now who had such bad heart disease, such massive heart attacks, such massive damage to their heart. They were told the only thing that could keep them alive was a heart transplant, which is one of the epitomes of high-tech medicine, also one of the most expensive. It's about a million and a half dollars per patient, plus a lifetime of immunosuppressive drugs. And so one of the patients was a guy, is a guy named Robert Troyhertz, who's an internist himself, and he had a massive heart attack. His ejection fraction went down between 11 and 15%. That means his heart was barely pumping. And he was told the only thing that could save his life would be a heart transplant. So he went through our program on reversing heart disease at UCLA. Uh, Medicare and other insurance companies are now covering our program. We've been training hospitals and clinics and physician groups around the country. We're really creating a new paradigm of true health care, as you mentioned in your, in your uh, uh, lecture, as opposed to sick care. And it's working. We're getting bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings, and better adherence than anyone's ever shown. Um, and we're also showing that uh, how powerful these changes can be. So I want to show a five-minute video. He went through our program at UCLA for nine weeks to get in better shape for the heart transplant while they were looking for a donor. You know, it's hard to find someone to donate their heart. It's not quite like donating blood. And so you have to wait for someone who usually gets, you know, killed in a motorcycle record or, wreck or something awful. And while waiting for the donor, he went through our program just for nine weeks, and his heart disease improved so much in nine weeks, he didn't need a heart transplant. So, like, what's the more radical intervention here? A heart transplant or eat well, move more, stress less, and love more? So this is a short few-minute video. If you could run the video, uh, it'll make it more real. My wife and I were having a very vigorous, full, robust life with uh, working full time and enjoying our kids and enjoying uh, the environment that we're in, which is up in the mountains. And, and then uh, one day on October 29th, 2015, we were both in a near fatal head on collision. Unfortunately, uh, the next day I had a cardiac arrest and uh, quite literally passed away. And the process of regaining consciousness was an agonizing, prolonged climb out of a dark, empty void. Come here. 
But I heard my wife's voice call me back. And I was able to will my consciousness back to her. And that's uh, really when our journey started. I found myself alone and caring for him until the heart transplant workup where Dr. Boss came into the room and said, you know, there's one last thing that you could do. So the kind of chest pain I was having was the kind that makes you afraid to get out of bed. I was afraid to sit up without someone helping me. I was afraid to walk to the bathroom because I was afraid every time I got chest pain that was, that, that was the end, literally. My ejection fraction dropped to uh, somewhere between 11 and 15 percent. Normal is uh, generally considered to be over 50 percent. Mine was down to 11 to 15 percent, which made me unable to, to almost move or get out of bed or walk or do anything without some assistance. I was immediately dizzy, short of breath. My blood pressure would drop with every exertion. And immediately I said, let's do it. This is, yes, it's a diet. Yes, it's lifestyle changes, but it's something that we can do. Let's give it a try. As my husband was just going, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And I, I really didn't think it was going to work. And uh, I heard that there was, you know, yoga and some other things. and and a love and affection component, which, which frankly sounded, sounded corny at the time. I would say within about 10 weeks, I started seeing incredible results. To, to my astonishment, after a few weeks, the angina started to improve. All of a sudden, his chest pain is getting less and less. Um, we moved from down here in our home. We couldn't, he couldn't go up the stairs. We went back into our own bedroom, which was huge. He was going up the stairs. Um, the weight started to come off. Well, I would say, no matter what anyone tells you, it works. You can't argue with success. And here we are today. My husband went from dead men walking to taking strolls on the street and taking our dog for a walk at 6,000 feet. I'm grateful. We look at the before and after pictures of me, the pictures of me after the heart attack. As, as a physician, I've seen many dead people who look much better than I did. And it's not an exaggeration. I looked ashen and gray and, and washed out uh, and cachectic at some points. Uh, and now, arguably, uh, I feel as good as I ever had at any point in my life. And as long as you truly love your spouse, you will do anything to make them better. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> My best friend. I'll even let him take my lipstick off. Can you believe this is my wife? <laughs> so that's an amazing example. And you've had many, many more, right? You even have images of the coronary arteries filled with plaque reversing. Yeah, we've uh, done Several randomized trials showing that we can do that. We have data now on over uh, 10,000 patients who've been through our program, and it's working. And um, again, it's not to say that there isn't a place for drugs and surgery. As you know, they can be life-saving in a crisis. But you know, bypass surgery is literally bypassing the problem. It's not treating the cause. And so the problem tends to come back again. Uh, we can give a pill or a poly pill to lower your cholesterol and blood pressure and, and so on. And, but you know, when when patients are prescribed these pills to lower their cholesterol, their blood pressure, their blood sugar, and they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? The doctor usually says, forever. You know, when I lecture, I often show a cartoon of doctors busily mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing. It's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like, forever. Well, why don't we just turn off the faucet, which is really the lifestyle choices, which are really the cause of these problems. And what we invariably find is under their doctor's supervision, most people can reduce or get off these medications altogether. 
And so they start to feel like they're getting better instead of being reminded several times a day that they're sick. We also found that these same lifestyle changes can cut overall healthcare costs in half in the first year. Uh, we did a demonstration with Blue Cross Blue Shield of uh, Pennsylvania. We did another one with, High, with um, Mutual of Omaha. They saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year. 86% of the $3.6 trillion we spent last year on healthcare are for treating chronic diseases that are often preventable and even reversible. So I helped create a new field called lifestyle medicine, which is lifestyle changes not only to help prevent disease, which we all know, but to treat and often reverse it, either in combination with drugs and surgery or often as a direct alternative to those. And, and you've been a sort of part in this whole journey. How is it, you know, from the, from the physician side to the, uh, you know, a lot of work you've done on yoga and meditation, what, are there sort of best ways to enter this undoing that, that you found is sort of the best entry path? I think the very first question, and then the one that gets reinforced daily when we're making changes in our lifestyle, is why? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to change? Why, it's not about just living longer, it's about living better. And so it's a very personal question that we all need to start with is, what is your motivation? Mm -hmm. And so when you reflect on the, in that very personal way, or you know, who are the people and the things that we love the most, that light us up, that make us feel alive, and just like we saw in this video, that we'll often do things for, for people that we love that we wouldn't even do for ourselves. And that's okay if that gets us going and keeps us making those healthier choices. But that's, you know, imbues our choices with meaning when we have a motivation. And it might change, you know, and evolve over time. But that's one of those things that we meditate on every day because that's the engine from which um, we get our, when we're sourcing to, we all have all these choices, you know, at step after step each day. And so we have to reinforce it. As Dean was talking about and as we saw in this video, we can have something very life-threatening, a diagnosis, an accident. Um, a, a end of a, of a relationship, a loss of a job. We can have these very traumatic things that happen that get our attention. And for a moment, like, okay, I'm gonna do whatever the doctor tells me to get out of this um, kind of flight or fright. Um, but when it comes to making sustainable choices, we have to go deeper than that. And we have to get very personal and very real with ourselves. And so to the extent that we can answer that for ourselves and that we do so every day that we're checking in, and then when we make those choices, we start connecting the dots between what we do and how it makes us feel. So at day after day, when I do this, it makes me feel good. I'm gonna do more of those things. And when I do this, that's not, not serving me so well. I can remember why I started eating this way, stopped walking, stopped doing these things. Now with my little bit of self-awareness and reflection, then we'll, we'll no longer do those things. Choose to do the things that get us into a virtuous cycle because um, they're serving us better and those yeah. around us. And there's also like a, I think in the tech world in Silicon Valley, there's a certain ethos of, there's an assumption that we want to live forever. You know, like, how can we extend our life? How can we live forever? But you asked me earlier how I got interested in this. I got interested in doing this work when I was suicidally depressed when I was 19 and in, at uh, Rice University in Houston, was ready to do myself in, because I could take all the meaning out of something. As Anne was saying, um, meaning is, uh, there's a wonderful book that Viktor Frankl wrote 60 years ago called Man's Search for Meaning, looking at Holocaust survivors in concentration camps. And the ones that survived weren't the strongest or healthiest, they were the ones that had the strongest sense of meaning and purpose. I, I want to survive this so that I can, what you fill in the blank, you know, be reunited with my loved ones, watch my kids grow up, dance at their wedding, whatever. So I learned I could take all the meaning out of life, you know, who cares, so what, nothing matters, big deal, you know, why bother, etc. But I also learned that you can put meaning back in, and one of the ways of doing that is by, for example, choosing uh, to be, uh, only eat certain foods, for example. Is that deprivation? It can be, but I think just the act of choosing only to do certain things or be with just one person or, uh, you know, I think with, why all spiritual paths have dietary guidelines, even though they're often different from each other, just the act of choosing not to do something or choosing to do other things can, can imbue those choices with meaning. And then if it's meaningful, then it becomes sustainable. So beginning with the power of why, um, maybe for 
any of your favorite from the categories there, move more, eat well, love less, stress less, are there some key things for almost everyone here that it can start with that kind of scintillates uh, actionable? Uh, yeah, the, I think it's, uh, I mean, I learned from Steve Jobs, you know, he was telling me that, you, you know, he's more proud of what you took, what he left out of the iPhone than what he put in it. Uh, that if you really, people that don't know anything about something is people who spend their life doing it can make it simple without being simplistic if you really spend your life. So we reduce it down to its essence. Eat well is basically to the degree you can move towards this way. It's not all or nothing. If you're trying to reverse disease, it takes a lot. That's, it's the pound of cure. But for most people, to the degree that you can eat a plant-based diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, as they come in nature, as close to that as possible, low in fat, low in sugar, to um, you know, move more, whatever you kind of exercise you want to do. If you can build it into your daily life, you know, just take the stairs or take, the, you know, instead of the elevator or, you know, park a little bit further away, you know, just little things that you can do to incorporate it into your daily life. Get a portable phone so you can walk around when you're talking on the phone. Little things like that add up. Uh, stress less, practice some kind of meditation. Even a few minutes a day can make a difference. As Ann said, the consistency is more important than the duration. Even a minute or two a day can really kind of make your fuse longer. Things don't bother you as you go through the day. You can accomplish even more without getting stressed in the process. And my favorite, which is love more, which uh, I'll let uh, Ann talks about that more eloquently than I do. You want to talk about that for a moment? Well, I think that this whole lifestyle really is an act of, of love. Um, when we talk about love more, people think, oh, my relationships, and relationships are essential. They're how we've evolved, what brings the most meaning to our lives. And at the same time, if we don't love ourselves, then we can't really, we're not open for others to really love us. And if they do love us, sort of like in this social media way of how many likes, how many did I get, how many comments did I get, it doesn't feel as gratifying if th those people on social media where we spend, spend the average adult spending five more, more than five hours a day on their screens, it's a lot. So when we think about how busy we are, oh, I can't you know, spend time with people I love, I can't time to spend time to meditate. It's like if you just reappropriated even 30 of those minutes to take a walk and 15 minutes to meditate, eight minutes in the morning, eight minutes in the afternoon, it would transform your life. So by doing these as an act of loving yourself, which is, is, is actually the, the most selfish and the least selfish thing you can do because then you have so much more to give and you're doing it from an authentic place instead of just presenting the best of um, who you think you are and who people are going to like on social media, which people are just obsessing about. So when they get a like, when they get someone who comments on it, it feels like only because they had this great picture with the, you know, arm around the attractive whatever celebrity person or whatever the, it's going to get the dopamine hit. But it's the people that we actually spend and if you just spend five of those minutes calling somebody, like, you know, there's sort of the graph on social media of like a like versus a comment. Well, if you really, and if you send a comment to somebody, it f makes you feel like, oh, we actually just had a little conversation that feels more meaningful. That kind of makes that person more on your graph, get pushed notifications about them. It's like, just pick up the phone. For the five minutes that it, it takes to, say, compose something on social media, you're going to get, feel so much better about yourself and be that much more likely to make healthy choices. If you call somebody for five minutes, like in our group support, so more people go through our nine-week program, the group support is set up by first having a, a self-reflection. So each person just closes their eyes and checks in with themselves. How am I feeling right now? It sounds really basic, but it's actually a profound first step. It's just self-awareness, having that curiosity and compassion to, 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 to reflect mm. and, and feel what you're feeling, not your thoughts. It has to be a feeling like, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling anxious, the, the gal who was speaking before us. These are epidemic. But by having compassion, not trying to, to solve it, but just by having a sense of how we're truly feeling, then as the next step, the second step is to share that with other people. And again, not asking them to solve your problem, just being able to share, I'm feeling this way, and then asking another person, how are you feeling? Letting them share it. Doesn't have to be solved. Yeah. Just the act of knowing how you're feeling, sharing it with another, having empathy and um, compassion to hear what they're saying, that right there is low-tech healing that is profoundly 
powerful. Yeah, and even the word healing comes from the root to make whole. Yoga is from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, bring together. You know, study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed, as Anna is saying, are three to ten times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community. Nothing in medicine, even smoking, doesn't really compare to that. And so, you know, as Anne said, there's one of the studies we quote in our new book is there was a study that the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are. Now, why would that be? Because it's not an authentic intimacy. It looks like everybody has this perfect life but you because people don't talk about their fears, their self-doubts, the problems with their kids or other things on social media in most cases. And yet when you grow up in a family 50 or 60 years ago that had an extended family or two or three generations of people living in a neighborhood or a, or a church or a synagogue or a mosque that you go to regularly or a job you've been at for 10 years or more, you really get to know people. And they know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile. They know where you messed up and where you're, you know, where you went to jail, you know, or you broke that window or whatever, or you failed or whatever. And you know that they know, and they know that you know that they know, and they're still there for you. And there's something primal about just feeling seen, you know, like uh, in Avatar, uh, James Cameron, I see you, you know, it's I see all of you, not just your best self, but all of you, and I'm still there for you. And so as Anne says in our support groups, they're not really designed around staying on the diet. They're designed around creating a, a sense of community where people can let down their emotional defenses and really connect at a deep level. And we use the technology, Zoom for example, Anne found works just as well for connecting people as long as they're doing it in a way that's authentic as opposed to just you know, showing your best life. And, and just epitomize here, health is social, and a lot of these tools, a lot of, we have a lot of leaders here who have organizations, big communities can implement some of these in their workspace, a meditation room, mindfulness before a, a meeting. Uh, Absolutely, and when you do, your healthcare costs go down, and since most large corporations are self-insured, that accrues directly to your bottom line. And especially, you know, 5% of people account for 80% of healthcare costs. So those are the people with chronic diseases, and by focusing on actually reversing those conditions, then we can save huge amounts of money in the first year. Right. So we're about out of time. Any kind of closing thoughts that would pull this together for folks in the exponential universe? Anne, you want to go first? Um, I think it, it just comes back to if you can make five minutes three times a day and consistently in the morning, sometime midday, and at the end of your day for self-care, whatever in whatever form of eat well, move more, stress less, and love more, 15 minutes, you are very powerful and empowered people with your schedules, with your time, just as with Warren Buffett. So if you can schedule those five minutes to take back the reins of your health, um, I look forward to hearing from it the next time we run into each other. <laughs> yeah, and, and in closing, the, one of the most powerful aspects of meditation is that it quiets down your mind to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being. And to realize that these techniques don't bring us a sense of peace of well-being, that rather we have that already. It's our nature to be healthy and peaceful and happy until we disturb it. And so the question then becomes not how can I get those things that I don't have, but how can I stop disturbing what's already there? And so at the end of a meditation, when your mind is more quiet, you can access your own inner wisdom. And all of the studies that we've done have really come from that place. It's that still small voice within that that wakes you up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest. And you can actually access and dialogue that. So at the end of a meditation, when your mind's more quiet, ask your own inner wisdom, which we all have, to speak to you. And it, believe it or not, it generally will. And what I've learned to do is to ask a very simple but very powerful question, which is, what am I not paying attention to that I need to? And just listen. And that voice will tell you. And I've learned to trust that. And it's Really, you know, I, then I can reverse engineer and see if we can prove something in a study. But the insight, the real wisdom is already there. And so um, it's not something you have to get. It's something that we have already. That's why we call the book Undo It. Uh, my spiritual teacher used to, people would say, what are you, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo. You know, and so my favorite key on the uh, computer has always been the undo button. And our bodies have this remarkable capacity to begin healing and much more quickly than we had once realized when we can treat the cause rather than just literally or figuratively bypassing it with surgery or a lifetime of medication, but to treat the real cause, which are to a much larger degree than we had once realized these simple lifestyle choices that we make every day. And if we all want to live into this exponential age and address grand challenges and do good in the world, we have to take care of ourselves, love more, <laughs> connect more, and that will help us raise the ship for all of us and make a better world. So with that, I want to thank Dean and Ann Ornish for their pioneering work and bringing this to the thank rest you, of the world. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.